I'd like to welcome you to Spirit and Truth Fellowship today. My teaching is about following me. And I don't mean following me. I really mean why people follow Jesus. So we're going to be looking at some scriptures. And um, I ask myself all kinds of questions about things that maybe the scriptures just don't speak about. Um, so look, we're looking at Mark 6 and 33. It says they ran on foot from all the cities. Now try to imagine Jesus and these people are running to him. And how, how would that feel? Sometimes they multitude stayed for three days without nothing to eat. Matthew 15 and 32. Now I'm thinking myself, this is Ed. So all these people are here, they don't have food. They don't have water. Why would they even stay? And then say bathroom times. How does 5,000 people, where do they go to the bathroom? Well, uh, this, is, this is so crazy as far as, as um, if, if I was Jesus, all these people were here and they're following me. And if I go from place to place, they're following me. So I asked myself that, why, why? Now, of course, some of them are following them just to mock them, to laugh at them. They, they're skeptics. They don't really, they don't really care. They're, they're just there to make fun of Jesus. And others are, would not only would follow him, but they actually want to be his disciples or his students. Uh, next week, I'll talk more about um, those types oh. of that's, that's different from others. So myself, this is what I do. I ask myself, why, why, why? All, and all these questions. Why would a fisherman leave his job as a fisherman? I like fishing. Somebody says, follow me, and he does. And tax collector says, follow me, and he does. So there's something behind all of this. And that's what I want to share with you today, some, some of my thoughts of why people would follow Jesus. And hopefully that this will be a blessing to you, as is for me as I study the scriptures and and some of this stuff, obviously, is speculation on my part, but a lot of this stuff's right from the scriptures. So that's what we're going to do today. And these are my assumptions, that whatever I do, I have a reason for it or a purpose for doing it. If I repeat it, then I believe it has a benefit for me. It may be a real benefit or maybe an imaginary benefit, which is really not actually blessing me, or maybe a benefit to someone else. So that's part of my assumption. I do things for a reason. Also needs motivate or should motivate my actions, whether the needs of me or the needs of somebody else. And so I might stop as an example to let somebody get in on a busy uh, sec section of town so they can turn right or they can turn left. So what, so needs to me are motivations. Now, if I, there might be physical needs, like I may be thirsty. And so I'll, I need something to drink or I, I may be hot or I may be cold. I might have physical needs or I might have relational needs. I need somebody to talk to, somebody that I can be with. Or I may have spiritual needs, things that I may, may need healing, may even need a doctor. So needs are really, really important. And so today we're going to be looking at the various needs or why people respond the way they do. Um, wherever Jesus went, they would follow him. They would go after him. They would seek him for very first reasons. Some are good and some are bad. So I may consciously know my needs, which is wonderful, or the needs of others. But other times I don't know. And then so I really believe that God wants me to be aware of the presenting needs of whoever is um, talking to me. And to find out really what's happening with them, what, what do they need, and what, how does God want me to be involved in their life, if at all. So in today's sharing, I'm tempted to answer the whys that I have and the reasons why people follow Jesus. Hopefully that'll be a, a blessing to you. So next uh, session I'll be teaching, I'll be talking about more of why people follow Jesus then. So not only follow him, like I said, but we want to be his disciples and to learn even more. And some people ask to be his disciples and other times Jesus chose them to be disciples. And then why are people following Jesus today? So that's what we're going to be looking at but next week. But for today, we're looking at why people would, would follow Jesus. Now, some came to be healed of their blindness. So they heard that Jesus healed the blind. And so Jesus is coming and they know where he's going or whatever. And so they're, they're, they want to go there. Now, it's also interesting that some people, they, they had an inability to speak. And so they would have to somehow... Um, convey to others that they want to follow Jesus, they want to be with them, and 
whatever needs that they have, it's even harder. And others, they're an inability to walk. If we look at right here, um, so I'm just get this laser pointer on. So right here, we can see, it looks like somebody's carrying somebody else. And this fellow right here looks like he's on some type of, of crutches. So there are um, various needs that people have that, and that Jesus meets them. In Mark 7 and 31, it says, having departed from the region of Tyre, so here's Tyre right here, he again came to the Sea of Galilee. So here's the Sea of Galilee right here. So here's Tyre, here's the Sea of Galilee. So that would be the normal way I would think that Jesus would get there and maybe come down to this area. Um, but the scripture doesn't say that. He says he went by the sea, to the Sea of Galilee by the way of Sidon. So where's Sidon? It's right up here. And then through the middle of the region of Decapolis. So we'll look at that next slide. And here's the Decapolis. Now the word Decapolis, the D-E-C-A here, means 10. And so these are the 10 cities. So here we see them right here. And if you remember the story of the, the Gadarean demoniac, um, Jesus told him, because he wanted to, he wanted to follow Jesus. So here's somebody who to follow Jesus, but Jesus says, no, no, go back and tell the people what, what God did for you. And so he went back to Decapolis. And so this is, these are the 10 cities right here that people would probably know him, the crazy things that he was doing. And then he was telling what God did to him. So if we look right here, so this is where Jesus was and underneath the side of Decapolis, um, the side, and then he came back this way. Now, this was the way of most of the Gentiles. That's the way they live right here. And so it says large crowds from Galilee. So this area over here and the Decapolis, these 10 cities right here and villages and from Jerusalem, which is down here. And then this area of Judea. And then it says in the region across the Jordan. So here's the Jordan River. And look who's across the Jordan, the Samaritans right over here. So people that were half Jews, half, half Gentiles. So Jesus is has chosen, and I believe by the direction of God, instead of taking the shortest route going to here, he's taking the longest route. And sometimes it, as a follower of Jesus, you, you might think, well, this is the easy way to do it. But God has a plan for you that might say, I want you to go to a different route, a different way. I have a plan for you. And we see that's, that's what Jesus did. So he says, and Jesus departed from there and came close to the Sea of Galilee. And he went up into the mountain and sat there. And great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And he laid them down at his feet and he healed them. And so we can see this as a picture of Jesus. Here's a baby. We don't know what what, what's wrong with this baby. But we know that Jesus, people would present to Jesus a baby or a daughter, or um, their friend, or their maybe whatever. And the scripture says that Jesus healed them. Other times there were people that were blind or deaf, or, and here's a child that's uh, waiting and the mother's saying, just be patient, be patient, uh, Jesus will be with you. So could you imagine that if you were there and you saw this person that was blind, they could see, or the lame, they could walk, how you would feel um, and you're there, you have needs, um, you also have needs. As a result, the, the crowd were amazed, and so would I be. And when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, they glorified the God of Israel. Now remember, most of these people were Gentiles. And, Jew, and Jew, Jesus was a Jew, and he had, and he had a God, and what they did, because of what Jesus did, they glorified the God of Israel. This was not their God, but it may soon be their God. They may have pagan gods. And because of what Jesus did in a region of Gentiles, um, they glorified the God of Israel. I just want to point that out um, to you. Now, I also want to look at this word, these many others. So it's we just read this, great multitudes came to him having with them the lame, the, the, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and laid them down the feet of Jesus and he healed them. But then it says, and many others. So I want to share with you today um, what my thinking is about who these many others are. So 
Who were these many others? Well, and as we do this, I can identify in part or in whole these other people that were there. Because i that's what I try to do. If I was there, who would I be? And I encourage you to also ask yourself, would I be like that or would I be like this? Often when there's a story, we always take the good person and that's who we are. If there's good seeds, we're the ones that sow good seeds, not the bad seeds or whatever. So the first group of people that I think were there were the skeptics. And they and they were, could be all over the place. I mean, Jesus might recognize them, not recognize them. Now remember that most of them, the majority that were there were from Galilee. And so they would they would follow Jesus. But there are all kinds of others who made up that multitude. Now, who are the skeptics? Well, the skeptics were those who were convinced that Jesus was a fraud or some sort of magician. I just I want to just share um, my what happened to me. I was I was 15 years old. This was 1960. And at that point, I had all kinds of questions about God. It started when I was in grade seven. So now I'm a little bit older. I played tennis at Jackson Park in a tennis court with a friend named Ted Stanley. And while we're playing, they had a tent meeting that was not too far in the distance. You can hear the, the speaker. And of course, it's not cool when you're a 15 year old to want to know about God. But Ted and I were getting tired and it was hot. And so I said, hey, Ted, why don't we just go in the back of the tent meeting and watch the um, whoever's there. Now, the guy was named Leroy Jenkins. I never forgot this because it, it really affected me in my walk with Jesus. And of course, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but it affected the, my walk with Jesus or my not walk with Jesus or my following Jesus or not following Jesus. I'm going to tell you that story. So Ted and I sat at the back and Leroy Jenkins, he's making an appeal um, and for for people to be healed. And on the stage, he's got wheelchairs and crutches and other apparatus. And so the so then he says, okay, I, I have a word from God. I have a word from God. There's someone here that, uh, that can't walk very well. Uh, who are you? And this man stands up, it's me, oh God, it's me, it's me. I want to be healed. And so he says, in the name of Jesus, I command you to walk. And Nolly said, Nolly walked. And then the guy starts running around. And then he says, there's someone here that, that has crutches. Where are you? And the guy says, it's me. I'm over here. And he says, come up here. And he puts his hand on. In the name of Jesus, I tell you, throw those crutches down and run. And so the guy threw the crutches down. And he picked the crutches up. You won't need it anymore. And he throws them on the stage. And you know what I'm thinking? This is a but this is garbage. This is bull. This is just, and I don't, I don't believe this is happening. A few minutes later, he says, okay, now there's other people that need healing. And uh, we're going to pass the basket now. And uh, just put in what you feel that you know that you want. The, this gentleman here that you got healed, you know, did God do that? Yes, he did. So we need to pay for this and pay for this. So we are going to pass the basket. And so they did. They passed the basket, and it was it was like a big barrel, a basket, a Kentucky Fried Chicken type basket. They passed these baskets around. So I'm thinking, con, con, con. And then what happens next? He um, he says, "Okay, you there, sir. Um, what's your problem?" And I don't remember exactly what the problem was. And so he says, "In the name of Jesus, I tell you, be healed." And um, and nothing happened. And then he said, "What?" He said, in the name of Jesus, I tell you, be healed. And nothing happened. And then he he said, just, you know, I, how, by chance, how much did you put in the basket? And now I don't remember, but say he said $5. He says, $5? Is your healing worth $5 or is it worth more? He said, well, all this worth more. Okay, so if you, if you just put a little small amount in the basket, then you need to put more in the basket. You got to put what? When you feel this is worth, this is this is God doing the healing. So now he passed the basket around more. And I'm thinking, this is just, a, this is garbage. This is so terrible what he's doing. And so for, so for me, so for me, that just, uh, that just wrecked my um, thinking of who Jesus was. So I, I too thought Jesus was a fraud or this guy was a fraud. 
And so that that's what that's what happened to me. So if I saw a miracle or they saw a miracle, a healing, a skeptic, uh, they would say this is not true. They would not believe even if they witnessed what was truth was proclaimed. Now, later on, to get a chance, I would encourage you to read Ch John chapter 9 and verses 1 to 41. We're not going to read that today, but it's about Jesus healing the, the man that was blind. And we put mud on his eyes and you can read that. But I do want to look at one, one verse of, of, of it, verse 18. It says, now the Jews, not the Jews as a whole, but the religious leaders did not believe about him that he'd been blind and had received his sight. Well, they called the parents until they called the parents the one who received the, his sight. Now, there's all kinds of stories you can read about that, why the parents didn't want to say anything. He's of the age. And so he must have been about 14, 15 or 16 years old, like I was when that happened. But he, he, but he was healed. So he was still living with his parents. And so what I really thought, I asked myself, okay, why didn't he believe what, what, what happened? Why didn't this happen to him? Well, 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 tells me. Skeptics, including Ed, when he was 15 years old, this is what I believe it happened. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. I didn't believe to keep them from seeing and shining forth the light of the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So let's look at this, the God of this age. Well, who's the God of this age? And this is God, the same word God as we think of our, the almighty God. So the God of this age uh, is Satan and his, and his workers. And what does he do? He blinds the minds of those who do not believe. So if you don't believe, he doesn't want you to believe. Why? To keep us from seeing and shining forth the light of the good news of the glory of God, who is in the image of, of God, the glory of Christ, rather, who is in the image of God. Now, obviously, if someone's in the image of God, then it can't be God. So this is the glory. This is what this is what's happening of the Messiah and keeps us from seeing the seeing. So you, you, you're blind. You can't even see Jesus. If you have eyes, see. And then ourselves is shining forth. So once once you know that, well, you've been healed, then you're going to be telling others. You're going to be a mouthpiece for the, for God because you you know what's happened to you. Or you prayed for somebody and they they got healed, then that just blesses you that you're going to pray for somebody else. So who who were these many others? Well, they were they were the skeptics like like Ed was. Okay, so who were who other people were there? Well, they were fault finders and they were all over the place. Now I, I'm, I'm like that too. When I come to um, say a new, like a, like first time I came on Spirit and Truth Fellowship, okay? So I'm looking for, do they agree with me? Is their teaching is similar to my teaching. So that's what I do. So whether you're religious leaders or not, I was actually looking for fault of what people were saying and they were looking for fault what Jesus was saying. And don't we do that? You know. If you go to a church, do they agree with this, this, this? If they agree with you, then you continue. Now, the Bereans had a different attitude. They listened not as fault finders, but they listened eagerly to what Paul said, or they would probably, if they were with Jesus, they were listening eagerly to what Jesus said. And then how they find out if it was true or not, they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said or what Jesus said was true. I didn't do that. So as a fault finder, I would I'd be looking, do they agree with me? Because, of course, what whatever I believe is the truth. That's what I thought, okay? Not realizing I need to learn. And so they, they especially the things that were tradition and that were, were embedded, these were long-standing things. Whether they were, script, were there in Scripture or not, didn't matter. And the traditions that were taught were the teachings that they, de they derived they weren't scriptural. They were teachings of men. And then they became commandments of men. You must do this. You must do that. And I remember in my search um, as a Christian, without going into all the details, I did I did go to a, a Catholic priest on a Saturday morning. And he was telling me, they were talking about that Mary never died. And she and she raised, she, God raised her from the dead. I mean, not from the dead and took her to heaven. So I said, can you show me that? It's in the Bible. Well, it's not. It's tradition. And then I found out that traditions are teachings 
that are held over and over and over again that then people believe it. And if you don't believe it, then you're getting in trouble. So it's almost forced on you. So that's what traditions were. So what happens then for me, truth overrides the tradition. So I believe in the tradition more than I believe in the truth. And so these fault finders, that's, that was their mindset. That if you agree with me, that's fine. If you're saying stuff that's not what I agree with, then, then you're at fault, but not me. That's, so that's fault finders. Now in Matthew 15, Jesus said, uh, they said to Jesus, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders, the teachings of the elders? And Jesus, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, when he's feeding the 5,000, could you imagine that they're, they're there with that? They watch that because they following Jesus. He fed the 5,000. And all these people are eating the bread without washing their hands. And they're like, wow, wait a second. You're actually letting them wash, eat without washing their hands? And so this was kind of ridiculous um, thing that they were asking. Now, how did, how did Jesus respond to that? This is he and Jesus answered and said to them. Why do you even your, you yourselves transgress the commandments of God because of your traditions? So they're following the traditions of the elders, and Jesus wants us to follow the teachings of God, not the teachings of elders. Fault finders. Now, today, there are, those are fault finders who listen for mistakes, like I do. And sometimes when I, I was, when I was preaching, teaching, there would be people in the group, they're not listening for what I'm teaching they're listening for any mistake i make and i and actually approached one person and he agreed yeah that's what he's looking for whether it's wrong doctrine and of course whatever their position is or whatever my position is, it's always the correct position and don't we hold that you know if somebody brings something that's different than what you've been taught or you've held for years which is unfortunately it's not a, a really good place to be in i want to be like a brian now i also want to let you know Anything that ends in Aryan, I won't, I won't say I'm that, whether it's a Trinitarian or a Unitarian or whatever, a Presbyterian. <laughs> I, I don't want to be identified with anything other than people ask me, like, what are you? Now, if I know they're Christian, I might say I'm a Christian. Um, but if they're not, I, I don't say I'm a Christian or whatever. I say I'm a follower of Jesus. Now, in almost every religion, there's a Jesus in the religion. Did you know that? So if I say you're a follower of Jesus, that, that gives you an in right away, whether they're Muslims, because Jesus is, is in Islam, although they call him Issa, but he's he's one of their prophets. But if I say I'm a Christian for some, some Muslims, that would be right away an offense because of what the Christians in the past have done to the Muslims. So it's so for me, it's important. Um, that I don't, I don't come from a, that I know I, I want to come from a Berean position. They want to be a learner. And if that's you, that'll really be a blessing to you. Now there's, there's fault finders always find something to complain about. <laughs> if there's a meal, well, the, you know, the beans were cold or whatever, or I really don't like this. So if you have a fault finder attitude, unfortunately, you're going to miss a lot of blessings in your life with which you we really are it's too bad because of your attitude i know people like that they're they get upset about things i'm thinking man you're just always looking for the negative instead of the positive and that's what jesus did he looked for the positive in people and we'll be sharing that in a few minutes so here's jude 16 and these are people that that are have a negative attitude towards life they're grumblers complainers they walk after their own ungodly desires, and their mouth speaks grandiose things, flouting people for, for their own advantage. Who are they? Grumblers. Nobody wants to be around a grumbler. Fall finders. They're fa they follow no one but themselves. They don't listen to anybody else's ideas. And they boast about themselves, either verbally or by their attitude or their eye looks or whatever. And they flatter others for their own advantage. So there's other people that were there. They were spectators. Now at, a, at an arena, I, I watch hockey and I like watching it on TV and baseball, um, yay Houston. And, um, but 
God wants us to be more than spectators. There's all kinds of people that could be, wa be watching. So what are spectators? Well, the people came to watch for their own reasons. Now, sometimes I'll watch a game and because I record it, I'll play it back and forth, back and forth, because I want to learn how they did what they did or how did they do that so I can actually watch it. So there's different reasons for, for, for being there. But a lot of people came to see Jesus, not because they had spiritual desires or maybe they had little spiritual desires, but they came there for other reasons. And some of them for entertainment. Now, you remember Herod? He wanted to see Jesus because he wanted to see Jesus perform some miracles. And so that's a wrong reason um, for being there. That's your only reason for being there. Now, if they because Jesus did miracles, and they say, well, I hope Jesus does a miracle. God's working through him through me. That's completely different. But if your reason is just for entertainment, then that to me is not the reason that why Jesus came to do anything. Now, it's easy for churches today to entertain people and, and then make that, make that a drawing card, card to get them to come into the building. So if they're going to be entertained, and there's, and that's, there, there's some obviously the benefits from that. But maybe it's their special effects, the hype. I know what hype is. I teach for mad science and we want the kids to be excited about it. So we act and say words. Are you having fun yet? And they're saying, yes. He said, I can't hear you. Are you having fun yet? And they scream louder. Well, that's hype. But that isn't the move of the spirit of God. That's just man. Or they have great theatrics. And it's tailored for people who want to come to watch. Watch people perform watch the big screen or watch special effects, but they're not often there and they miss out on seeing the real Jesus. I remember one time I was invited to a, a church in Michigan and it was the, one of the biggest churches I've ever been into. Now, I don't remember how many exactly, but maybe there were three to 5,000 people. And on the stage, and I was really far back, on the stage came the choir and all these women came out with these gowns that they wore, long gowns, and it's amazing, I don't know how they did it, but they all came in perfect steps. And maybe there was 20 or 30 of them, I don't know exactly the number. They came across and they all turned exactly at the same time. And their, their gowns just made this motion back and forth and he settled. And then when the choir master started, they were just perfect pitch. So I asked myself then, okay, now I'm a spectator. I'm, I'm asking myself then, so how much time did they spend in preparing this, how many hours were spent getting their the them in uniform, if you will, in their beautiful gowns, rather than say proclaiming the truth who Jesus was? So spectators, you, you know, as the, just out of experience, we tend to watch and then we comment about the show after the performance rather than about Jesus, which is really really sad. But I could relate to that. Now the another group of people there. The people, they were self-serving. They went for themselves. Now, so that, so that whatever reason they had, it was just about them. And remember, the, mu the multitude were, from, were, were Gentiles, but there were a whole lot of people that were not Gentiles. I mean, not um, Jews, but they were, they were Gentiles. And so they could be a lot of kinds of people that come for reasons of their own. Now, who are self-serving people? Well, they have concerns for their own welfare and interests before those of others. Now, that's pretty normal. You want to take care of yourself. And they may be the one to get the seat first. And, and they want to get the best place or whatever. And if it was uh, entertainment, they didn't want to be the last one at the very end. So they would get there early and arrive early. So these are the self-serving people. Okay, And you can relate to that. Okay, So... Uh, Self-serving people tend to be wrapped up in themselves. Now, as the fish were being distributed, what do you think a self-serving person would want to do as far as, say, there's three left in the, the basket? What do you think they would do? They would probably take them all and give them to their, their, um, their friends be, beside them. That's what a self-serving person can do. Now, that's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to look out for the interests of others. And, of course, your own interests. But he also wants to see others as a reflection of themselves. In Mark 12 and in uh, 31, we, we can see this, okay? So here is, a, this is the, how Jesus wants us to see others. That that's me there. So 
<laughs> so that the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. So what does that mean? Well, you see other person, that's that's me there. The other person's me. And that's what Jesus said. And he says, there's no greater commandment than these. And that one of the course was love God, yours, there are heart, soul, and mind. But the other was love your neighbor as yourself. And we have, um, that's what Jesus said that. We we have um, people that take the, our garbage away. And if, if I just want to show you this. i point this out. Here we go. Okay, if you see the, the, the front of this right here, see it's all dinged and danged up. Um, if you have a plastic garbage can in Canada and the, the, the engineers that um, get rid of the garbage for us, this thing, we call them sanitary engineers, quite often they would just throw the can down, the plastic can, it would actually break. Now with the metal ones like this one, they would dent. But, and then sometimes they just dump some of the garbage, and just leave it on the floor or the ground and they have to clean it up, put it back in for the next week. But there was this one um, sanitary engineer and he was a happy guy and he had a smile on his face. And he, he after he emptied it, he put the garbage can back down. If there was a lid, he put it on top of it. And I had, one day I asked him, I said, you know, you're amazing uh, that, you know, you're do, you don't throw them. You don't just, and sometimes they even fall in the ditch because we have a ditch in front of our, our, our road. Why do you do that? Now, you know what the answer was? And I, I never forgot this. He says, I treat each home as if that was my grandmother's. I treat each home as that was my grandmother's. And that's the idea that Jesus wants us to have. Treat others as you want to be treated, but treat others as that's, that's yourself. And so here we see um, there are other people. They're the needy. And they can have all kinds of different needs. If, you, if we found this when we were meeting the needs of, needs of people, they would tell other people, hey, at the vineyard, you, this would, you could get this or you could get that. They have this or they have that. And so you, the needy would bring more needy people which is fine. So who are the needy people? Well, some to get, they needed food. And so they would tell other people, hey, at the vineyard, you don't have to have all these things. You just go there and they'll just bless you. And so some came to get food, but most of them didn't come to get Jesus. But one of the things that we would say is, you know, great, and glad you had the food. Can we just pray for you? And do you have, besides food, do you have any other needs? Well, one guy said, yeah, I, get, I don't have a can opener. And so I went to the kitchen and got our can opener and gave it to them. And I realized, okay, we, we need a bunch of can openers. <laughs> That's a need they need. And then we say, well, can we pray for you? Can we ask God to bless you? And that's one of the things that we, we did. Now, Jesus did the very same thing to the needy. And I believe we should too. So whatever, whatever the foods, whatever the needs was, was, was food or healing or acceptance. Those are higher needs or forgiveness or relationships, Jesus met those needs. And not only did he meet them at the minimum, but he was even more. So when they were hungry, um, his disciples said, well, tell them to go home. And Jesus, no, no, you feed them. What? And so he had them, they did this with 5,000 and 4,000 at different times. And so they he gave them bread. Now, when this bread's coming, they're it would be amazing. I would, wouldn't you love to do that? You're letting people take bread and there's more bread. Let them take a bread and there's more bread. And this, of course, would be fresh bread. Whatever, whatever bread, it was like three days old. This was like oven fresh bread. <laughs> God created it. It was really good. And also the fish that they had. This was probably the best tasting fish. Again, it wasn't all dried up, um, but it was tasty. And so some people came for, they heard about that. Man, this Jesus guy, you want some fresh bread? You want some you want good food? You know, I'm, I'm going to hope he does that. And that's actually what happened. And Jesus says this. In John 6, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate the loaves and were filled. Now, he, 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 didn't, he didn't get upset with them, but he, but he wanted more than that. So what did he say? He says, do not work for the food that perishes. So don't, don't come all the way here just to get food. You know, you, you come all the way. You love, you come, you're this from this town. You spend all this time just to get the food. Don't do that. But for the food that endures to life in the ages to come, which the Son of Man 
and that's identifying him as a human being, will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. And so we realize that Jesus is for sure, if you have physical needs, then and you're hungry, you're thirsty, or even if you have to go to the bathroom of physical needs, you're not going to be listening to the message. That's what you're focusing on. I am so hungry. I'm so hungry. So when Jesus feeds and meets their basic needs, now they can be ready to meet higher needs, whether it's a relational needs, healing need, or, or a spiritual need. And so it's really, Jesus saw that. Now the people, of course, the food was free. And Jesus is saying the food, the, Jesus, of course, is the bread of life and and. His food was to do the will of the Father. And so Jesus is teaching that. There's a higher need, there's a higher feeding that you need. And he didn't send, he didn't send them away. So who are these people? Well, the ones that needed healing, the skeptics, the fault finders, the spectators, the self-serving, and of course the needy. And I can relate to every one of those to some degree. Though so those are part of many others. Now, what did Jesus do? Jesus loved people no matter what the reason for following him or and I, literally following, going after him, not necessarily being a disciple, but some ask that we'll be talking about that next week. But Jesus loved people, no matter what the reason was for following them. And one of the reasons why is Jesus saw in something that I have, I don't often do, but I'm really trying to do is seeing what they could become, not where they were. So Jesus saw where they could, what they could become, not where they were. And what a great attitude that Jesus had when you saw that. So then what happened? Well, if you read John 9, the man that was healed blind, then he became a spokesperson for Jesus. He said, well, who's this guy, Jesus? Well, he's a prophet. Oh, he's a sinner. He's doing this on the Sabbath or whatever. Well, whether he's a sinner or not, I know God is working with him and through him. So the blind man, John 9, you can read that later, was a spokesperson for Jesus. Nicodemus, if you remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and John 19, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to Jesus at nighttime. And whatever reason he did, maybe because Jesus wasn't as busy, or maybe he was afraid that other people would see him come and see Jesus. But if we find that this Nicodemus, who is told that you, you have to, if you're going to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. You have to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born, born again. And so Nicodemus was born again. And how do we know that? Well, in John 19, verse 16, verse 16 chapters later, verse 39, this is what it says about Nicodemus. And this is after Jesus died. Nicodemus also came. The one who previously came to him at night, bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloe and, and about 75 pounds. This was for his, the burial. So Jesus in chapter three told Nicodemus this, you have to be born again. And there was a heart change. And now Nicodemus was serving and showing um, God uh, how much he loved God. And now the God that Jesus knew and, who, and he loved Jesus. So who were some of the others that helped? Well, Spectators became participants. The brother James is an example. Fault finders like Saul became defenders of Jesus. Self-serving like the woman at the well who said, oh, give me that water. I'll never have to come again. Became servants of Jesus. Matter of fact, she was one of the missionaries who went back to Samaria and, and told them, we found the Messiah. So she became a servant of Jesus. And then the needy, they learned to share who the Messiah of Jesus was. And we mentioned the blind man as one. Now, watch, look at this picture for a minute. And um, somewhere in this picture, these are hundreds and hundreds of people. Some of these people are looking at you right now. And there's at least three or four of them. So watch, look at the picture and see if you can spot those that are looking at you. Well, here's one gentleman right here. And he's looking at you. Here's another one that's not looking where everybody else is looking. He's looking at you. And here's another one right here. He's looking at you. And here's another one right here. And he's looking at you. And so people, and there's maybe some others, that lady right there, she may be looking at you too. So there are people 
who are not looking for Jesus. They're not looking at you and seeing Jesus, but there are people that are. And so my hope and my prayer for you and for me is that we would recognize and see in people who they are, what their needs are, and that the Spirit of God will work through us to these many other people. And so I, I would like to pray that uh, for you and, and for me, that we would be like Jesus. We would see people not in the condition that they're at, but in the condition that they can be when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that would be my prayer, that, that we would have a different attitude to those that are in need, the fault finders, the, the, the ones that are skeptical. Um, one time I prayed for a lady named Teresa and she was blind in one eye. She was going to, um, they were living in Ann Arbor and her husband was a dentist and he was upgrading his studies. And we were there for a seminar um, and the, the leader of the seminar said, we need some pastors to pray for people. So I, so stand up, you pastor. So I stood up and this late Teresa came to me and she, she said, um, I said, what can I do for you? She says, well, I'm blind in one of my eyes. Well, I never met a blind person in my life. <laughs> and, um, and so, so I started to pray for her and we had, we brought people from Windsor. This was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where and they're going to the University of Michigan um, for the for their education. And um, so when I started to pray for a demon manifested, <laughs> I've never seen a demon manifest before. And what she did was uh, kind of impossible, but she her back was on this back of the chair and then her body was turned forward like this. And then these voice, these sound was coming out of her mouth and she was just slobbering saliva while I'm praying for her. And I'm going, what's happening here? And the more noise she made, now people are all kind of round. <laughs> and I'm praying the prayers that I knew, like I'm saying, oh, Jesus or whatever, and nothing's happening. And then I realized when Jesus said, when the same thing happened to his disciples, is why can't we cast that demon out? And if you remember what Jesus said, he says, these are only come out with prayer and fasting. So then I realized that we, I'm just repeating prayers that worked before, but praying is talking to God. So if it's a different situation, don't, we don't repeat prayers, but ask God what to do. So, so now, so I'm, I'm praying for her and God says, and she's telling, told a little bit of her story about her, without going into all the details. God said, tell her to say, Jesus is my Lord. And he was, and she was going to speak to the demonic realm. He, I was doing, it wasn't happening. So she was to say, Jesus is my Lord. Now more people are crying out because she's making these guttural sounds, ah, making these sounds and slob, slobbers coming out of her mouth and her husband's there and my eyes are falling. <laughs> I'm kidding, what's going on? So, so I, I, I said, I said, Teresa, and I never did this before and I never did it since. Um, God is saying, if you want to be free of this demon, get your sight, you have to say, Jesus is my Lord. So now she's talking, but she didn't say Jesus is my Lord. She says, Jesus is the Lord. And then I got in some more insight. Jesus is every, Jesus, every knee will bow Every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord, but not everybody can say Jesus is my Lord. And so that was a statement of a true statement, but not a relational statement. So then Jesus, God told me, I believe, to say, no, Teresa, you have to say Jesus is my Lord. So, so then sure enough, she says, she says, Jesus, and she's just every she's just getting words out was slow. When well, I'm not gonna exaggerate it, but it was like Jesus is, and then between these sounds, my Lord. And the moment she did that, she collapsed. And this was uh, maybe 20 minutes that she was bent over like this, bowed this way. And you know what I thought? She died. I thought she just had a heart attack. So I kicked into CPR. 
<laughs> so what I did next, first thing you want to do, are they breathing? So I stuck my head, I stuck my head by her nose. So I'm laying down, like putting my head down like this. And in the arena, they had these they're like bell, bell glass or bell lights. They look the shape of a bell like this. And there's a big light bulb in, inside of them. Just happened to be that when I did that, my head would be in the middle of this light. So so she's she's breathing, but instead of this guttural, she's breathing, just calm, breathe in and breathe out. And then she opens her eyes and she says, she's looking at me like this. She says, you're glowing, you're glowing. <laughs> I'm, I'm not glowing. Then I looked up, I saw Teresa. It's just, I'm just having to have my head in this, in the middle of this, of this light. So it looked like I was glowing. And then she just said, I can see, I can see. And then she's putting one hand over one eye. I can see, I can see. And then she put her hand over the other eye. I can see, I can see. And I, and, and I was just praising God. Wow, <laughs> that, that was amazing. Now the next part of it, this was, this was certain, this, the thing was over and it was getting late. It was like we were driving back and forth from Ann Arbor. And so she she was just so thankful and, and her husband was sobbing, he was crying because all this was happening and it was just absolutely wonderful. So so during the night, we found out the next day, she got the, the gift of tongues. So she said, oh, Ed, last night, uh, these words were coming out of my mouth and she, she's, it was so beautiful. And she, she didn't know what the words were. So he explained to her that, oh, that, that, that was the gift of tongues. So that you're speaking prayers, language, you're listening to sharing that. Now we made, we kept contact. This is way before the internet. So they eventually finished their schooling. A year later, we were at another seminar in, in Detroit and she was there healthy. She gained weight and she was telling all her friends about Jesus. And we kept in contact for maybe three years and eventually we just lost contact. So here is, here's the time where God was at work. There was somebody in the crowd. There was an opportunity to share who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. And then listening to what the present thing was doing. I thought it was interesting this morning with Jeff talking that, that Jesus worked in the present. Now, as a, in, and when his teaching was, it was in the present. Now, when I teach, I'm right now I'm teaching the present, but I'm preparing beforehand. But, but Jesus didn't prepare beforehand. No, he might, sometimes he had words of knowledge beforehand, like Zacchaeus up in the tree. But, but he, when he spoke, he spoke in the present. And that's what the scripture says. It says, when you're before leaders or whatever, don't worry about what you have to say. The spirit of God will give you the words to say. And so this is my encouragement to you and to me, that as a follower of Jesus, Jesus says, the things that you see me do, you can do likewise. But we have to believe. We have to say yes to Jesus. We have to say, well, this is not an impossible. Jesus says nothing is impossible with God. And so my prayer for you and for me this week, that we will be true representatives of Jesus. And if there's opportunities to come, that even the supernatural will be part of our life. And then we'll have stories to tell others. Now, I have never, ever since then, if there was a demon or whatever, say, Okay, say Jesus is my Lord. So everything's fresh in the kingdom of God. And when we just repeat stuff, um, it, 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 I, I think it loses power because I, I think we're, we're repeating things rather than being in, in contact with, with our Father. So bless you. Thank you for coming today. If you have any comments, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll do my best to, to answer those comments. And for those that are watching live today, I thank you for coming. We'll have a discussion in a few minutes. God bless you.